All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Advanced DAX Problem Design Solution. What I want to do specifically in this webinar is kind of look at a few different scenarios that I've come across either while teaching or doing presentations where people have come to me with different problems, and we were able to solve those problems using a little bit more advanced DAX. Now, if you didn't see my last webinar, my last webinar was a little bit more geared towards kind of transitioning yourself from introduction to DAX into the advanced DAX, and we talked about filter context and those sort of things in the last webinar. And here, we're going to kind of build on that a little bit and go into more specific scenarios where we kind of present a problem, a design, and then a solution. On the screen here, you see all of my contact information. All right, so just real quick, a little bit about me. My name is Mitchell Pearson, of course. I am a business intelligence consultor, consultant, and trainer for Pragmatic Works. Um, in two months, I'll actually be with Pragmatic Works for five years, so I'm looking forward to that. I get an extra week of vacation, so how can you not be excited about that? I blog at MitchellPearson.com, and then if you want, you can follow me on Twitter as well, at MitchellSQL, where I tweet usually about once or twice a day about just Power BI related kind of stuff and information. All right, so in this section, we're going to talk through a couple different DAX functions. Now, some of these don't look particularly like they're advanced, um, and they're not, but in the context in which we're going to use them here is in more of an advanced concept. So we're going to talk through the contains function, the find function, as well as the search function. All right, so the first scenario I, I want to show you is I had a client that was actually in one of our Power BI boot camps, and what he wanted to do is he wanted to build a report for his executives, and his executives, they weren't IT folks. So he wanted to give them a chart, and inside of that chart, he would have all the measures that they wanted to display. So they were going to put all the measures inside of that chart and inside of that visual. And he didn't want his executives to have to go into the different tables and the different columns and search for measures and have to pull measures into the chart and remove measures from the chart. What he wanted to do instead is present his executives with a pre-built report and then all they had to do was actually have a slicer that would allow them to click on the slicer and that would automatically remove uh, measures from the, the chart or add measures back into the chart. And I thought that was a really cool example, so we kind of worked through a solution that would work for him on that. Uh, what we're going to do here is essentially use the contains function. And the contains function is really more of an if exist function. All right, so if it exists, then it returns true. If it does not exist, then it returns false. So if it helps you to kind of think about the contains function in that way, that's how we're going to use it here. We're going to use it kind of like if it exists or does this exist. It's going to return a true if the values for all the referred columns exist or if they are contained in these columns. Else it returns false. So if the value that we're looking for in the column does not exist anywhere in the column, it returns false. It does not exist. And the syntax for this, the way that you set this up syntactically is you start with the contains function. The first parameter is always going to be a table or either a table expression. And then the column that you want to search, so what is the column within that table or table expression that we want to search? And then the value that we're searching for. All right, so in this example, we're going to search for profit or we're going to search for three-month rolling to see if it exists inside of the table. So it doesn't make sense kind of looking at this in PowerPoint. So we're going to walk through the example, kind of go through a demo here. And I think at the end of that, it'll make very clear sense of what we're trying to do. So we're going to jump back over to Power BI real quick. And we're going to walk through an example of how to do this. All right, so what I want to do here is let's just add a quick little slicer. Actually, I can't even, at this point, I can't even add a slicer. So what I have in this chart is if I click on this chart, you'll notice that I've added profit, I've added rolling three months profit, and I've added my rolling 12 months profit as well. And if I come down here to the value section of the chart, typically what your users would have to do is if they wanted to add more values or they wanted to exclude values, they would have to do that right here in this value section. So they'd have to come down here, kind of expand these boxes, you know, open these up, uh, go into the value section, say, I don't want to see profit. So they'd exclude profit. And then, you know, five seconds later, they'd want to see it. So they'd have to come back up here into the search box, kind of search for the profit measure, and then drag that back down into the values, and then it shows up here. But what my client or customer really wanted to do is they wanted to have a slicer here. Unfortunately, you know, these measures here, they're not a column that exists in the database. So there is no... I don't currently have a list of measures that exist in a column, in a table that I can use as a slicer. Right? That's one of the main reasons why we create calculated columns is because we want to use those calculated columns as a way to kind of slice and dice our data. So since that doesn't exist, what we're going to do here is we're actually going to go ahead and create a new table that has a list of 
those different measures that we have inside of our, our data model. So up here at the top, on my home ribbon, I'm going to click on Enter Data. And what Enter Data will allow me to do is just kind of, kind of create a table on the fly here. So I just want to quickly create a table so we can walk through this demo. And the first one I'm going to put in this new column here is going to be called Profit. So that's one of my measures that I want to add to my slicer. The next one here is going to be my three months profit. And then the next one is going to be my 12 months profit. There we go. And then of course I need to go ahead and give this a name, give this table a name. So I'm going to name this table something like, um, I'm just going to name it measure. So that'll be the name of the column. And then the table at the bottom, I'm going to call this measures. And then I know I'm going to be using this as a slicer. All right, and then click OK, or I'm going to load that into my data model. Now, I'm going to be using the concept of a disconnected table here. What I mean by that is this table is not going to have any relationship inside of my data model. So if I come over here, you'll see we have this new table that we've added. If we go to our relationship tab, I can scroll over here. You'll see that we have this new measures table that we've added to our data model. And I don't have to create a relationship between this table and any other table. There's tons of blogs out there about disconnected tables, some by Rob Coley, some by the Italians, by um, Alberto Ferrari and Marco Russo. Uh, Chris Webb probably has a blog on that. Tons of blogs on how to use disconnected tables because once you learn how to use them without needing a relationship, there's really a lot of cool stuff you can do. We'll do a couple demos uh, with this concept today. So I have brought this table in. We could take a look at it here real quick just to look at it. So this is our table with the column and the three measures. And now what I can do is back on the reports view, I can come over to my measure table, bring that in as a slicer. So all I'm doing here is just adding a slicer to my report. Now that I have a column that I can pull from. And what I want to do is anytime I click on this slicer, I want it to effectively filter down this chart. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to bring in this again. This time I'm going to bring this in just as a table. And then I'm going to make the text there a little bit bigger. And notice how this table, the column from this table, is filtered anytime I select an item from my measures table. And that's how I wanted to work with this chart. Whenever I select an item here, I wanted to also filter my chart, not just the table. Since this, this slicer is able to filter this table, now what I can do is I can say, look, if the value of profit exists in the table, then return it on the table. If it does not exist or it's not contained in this column, then don't return it. And since the slicer affects the table, and the table, we would do our measure off of the table here, uh, then it will automatically kind of indirectly work there. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to check to see if it exists in the table. If it does, meaning it hasn't been affected by the slicer, it does exist, and we want to show it in the chart, else we want to remove it from the chart. So the first example here is going to be profit. And we'll do this calculation for really all three of our measures. So I'll zoom into my profit calculation. And the first thing I want to do is kind of do an if then else, some if then else logic. And the first thing we do with if, of course, is our logical test. And this is where we're going to use that contains function. And remember, contains function kind of works like an if exists. So if it exists. And remember, the first parameter is going to be a table. So the table we want to look at here is going to be the measures slicer table that we created. And then inside of that slicer table, we want to look at that specific column. So I'm going to look at uh, this table. I'm going to look at this column in that table. And then I want to search for a specific value. I'm going to just put in a literal string here. I'm going to hard code the value. But of course, if you had a DAX expression that was going to return your value for you, you could put that in here as well. But what I'm doing here, since we're looking at our profit measure, as I want to search that table and say, all right, does profit, the value of profit, does it exist in that column, in that table? If it does exist, then this is what I want to do here. I want to perform this operation here. So let's close that out real quick. If it does exist and it evaluates to true, let's see why this is not working here. Contains, if it evaluates to true, Should be good, but it's not picking up my IntelliSense. So let's figure this part out first. Measure slicer, measure, that looks good. The value I want to search for is profit, closed out, contains, open parenthesis. All 
All right, so I don't know why that wasn't popping up before, but now it is. So if it evaluates to true, I didn't really change anything, but just move the comma down, but now it works. All right, so if it evaluates to true, I want it to do this expression here. If it evaluates to false, we want to return a blank value. And what we're doing by returning a blank value is we're saying, look, if profit does not exist in this table, then return a blank value because it means that it wasn't selected in, in this slicer here. So we would then return a blank value and it would disappear from the report. So notice what happens when we kind of close out this expression here. I'm going to close outside of that expression and then I'm going to click on something other than profit. And if I click on something other than profit, you'll notice that profit no longer shows up inside of this chart that we're working with. So we've created it so that the slicer actually affects a table and we've put an expression on our measures to read from that table first before uh, actually displaying it in the chart. And now we don't have to go through the process of actually coming over here and adding values to the chart or removing them because you'll see that the value of profit still exists in the chart here, but it's not being displayed here, right? It doesn't, it, that little red line you saw before is no longer being displayed even though it's still in the value section making it essentially easier for those executives to be able to interact and work with this chart without having to learn all the intricacies of Power BI. So now we need to go ahead and just kind of modify the three months profit and the 12 months profit calculations real quick, essentially doing the exact same thing. So I'm gonna go and click on my rolling, my rolling three months profit, zoom into that one real quick, and I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna say if, and then we're gonna do our logical test here using contains again. The table that we want to do that on is going to be measures.slicer. And then the column that we're going to check is, of course, going to be measures slicer measure. So it's the slicer with the column within that table, rather. And then the value that we want to search for is going to be three months profit. And really, I want to make sure I'm getting the right thing here. So let me roll this down. I want to make sure I'm getting the right name. There we go. So we're looking for three months profit. And if if that does exist inside of that table, meaning it evaluates to true, then we want to do that original calculation, whatever that original calculation was. All right. If it does not exist in that table, then we want to return blank, of course, right? So we're going to return blank, and then we can close out that if statement and then hit enter. So same exact thing that we did on the profit calculation previously. So now if I come in here and I click on profit, profit shows up, three months does not. If I click on both profit and three months, they both show up. Now, 12 months is still kind of hanging out here, even though we're not selected, but that's because we need to go ahead and update that measure real quick. So let's go ahead over here so we can get kind of the complete end-to-end -end example. We're going to do the same exact thing here, basic if-then-else condition, and we're going to use contains for our logical test. So contains, and then our table is going to be measure slicer. The column here is going to be the measure from that table, and the value is going to be 12 months rolling. Close that out. In other words, if 12 months rolling does exist in this table down here, so it hasn't been filtered out, if it does exist here, then we want to go ahead and do that original calculation, else we want to return blank. Remember that the way blank works, and this, this, this logic here that we're using with if, then, else, and blank really works for a lot of scenarios, not just this dynamic slicer. But what blank does is if a measure that's in a chart or a table returns to blank, it automatically hides it from that chart. It automatically hides it from that table. So we're just forcing the value to blank so that it automatically hides it from that chart or from that table. So you can use this in a lot of different scenarios, not just dynamic slicer. A lot of times you might have a table that has a lot of blank values, and you're like, you know what, I want to force my measure to return blank so that it gets rid of all those hidden rows. Same concept. You would do the same type of thing there that we're doing here. So now, let's go ahead and close out that formula bar. Now if I click on any of these different measures, it's automatically going to make this dynamic. Let's see what happened here. Three months, 12 months is not working. So I must have, I must have typed in 12 months profit incorrectly, so let's fix that. Oh, I did rolling. So let's change that to profit, and then try that again. There we go. So now if I click three months, I get the three months. If I click 12 and three months, I get both. And then if I multi-select and select profit, I see that as well. So now what we've done in this example is we've created a dynamic slicer that allows your end users to really look at a list of measures that you've created and interact with the chart and with the table without having to go into the value section and change those items by simply using you know, some if-then-else conditional logic along with that contains function. So 
really cool example that I came across from just you know an end user that was in one of our boot camps that asked me how we could essentially do something like that. All right, so let's go back over here to PowerPoint real quick. And in the next demo, I'm going to use the find function. And remember that what I said here is in regards to the find function is that the find function itself is not an advanced function. You, you've used this with more than likely if you're in this, this webinar, you've used this function in DAX already. If you haven't used it in DAX, you've used it in some other programming language. So either way, this is definitely not something that is new to you. What we want to do here, though, the problem that I got, and this was actually from somebody on my last webinar, they asked me, how can I essentially, I want to, I want to do a like operator, something similar to a like operator in DAX. And DAX, unlike T-SQL, does not really have a like operator available to you. So I was able to simulate that or simulate something similar using the find function. What the find function does and the search function, they do the exact same thing. One is case sensitive, one is case insensitive. But what they do is they return the starting position of one text string within another text string. So I search a column, I search a text string for a value. So I might search Mitchell for the letter T. And what it does is returns the starting position of T within that, 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 that string that I'm searching. So it returns the starting position of T, which in Mitchell would be one, two, three, so it returned the value of three. That's what gets returned. So if a value gets returned, if I search Mitchell and I search for the letter T, the starting position of T, if a value gets returned and the value is three, that tells me that T exists inside of Mitchell, right? It exists. So it's a way of saying it, it, it would return that row because it does exist. Um, if it returns a value of zero, I know that Mitchell doesn't contain a letter of, let's say, Z, if I was searching for Z. So this is a way that we're going to kind of use this. You can use find and search in a lot of more advanced scenarios to, to, to kind of uh, generate these like type operations or similar operations that you just don't have a function for in DAX. So that's what we're going to do here in this scenario. All right, so let's jump over to our second demo here. And in the second demo, I want to walk you through kind of the problem that was presented to me. Like, like I said, once again, this came from somebody in the last webinar who sent me a question here. And what they wanted to do is they had a table that was similar to this, not exactly like this, but similar to this. And they wanted to be able to come in here and kind of filter this down to different departments. But if you look at the department goals table, let me show you what this table looks like here. Very simple table. If you look at the table, you have all of your different affected departments and then you have the hiring goals. So, you know, how many employees are we going to hire? What is our goal? for hiring in that department. And I can come in here and essentially create a slicer that will slice this table, that will uh, you know, slice and dice this table. But the problem that I have here is if I want to return all the rows from this table that contain the value or that are like IT, if I want to return all of those rows, I have to come in here and multi-select multiple selection in my slicer. And we know that this is a very tiny, small result set. This end user, of course, had many, many departments and many combination of departments and they needed to create something where they didn't have to come into their slicer here and select 20 different things to return all of the different goals for their IT department or for their finance department. So we're going to come up with a scenario here where instead of having this slicer that's derived from this table, we're going to create a new table with a list of items here and then we're going to use that as our slicer by using the find function and some other, some other things kind of in this complex DAX. So similar to our last example, we're going to go back up to the home ribbon and then I'm going to go up to enter data here and I'm just going to create a new table real quick kind of on the fly for this example here. So let me go ahead and click on enter data and then we're going to create a new table real quick and the column for this table will be called departments. And then for our departments, I'm going to create the first one here which will be IT, HR. I want to essentially create a, a, a record in this table, in this column, for every single distinct value that would show up. So the first one would be IT, the second one would be HR, the third one here would be something like finance, and then we would have our auditing department, and then we would have our tax department. All right, so I've gotten every distinct value that I could find in this list of values here. And then the next thing I want to do is come down here to the bottom, and I'm just going to give this a name. So I'll just call this table slicer. So we're simply going to use this table to perform a slicer type operation here inside of our table. So I'm going to load this into our table. There we go. And then we're really going to do the same thing here that we did before. 
Hold on one second. And then I really want to do the same thing we did before. We're going to leave this as a disconnected table. So once again, I'm not going to create a relationship between these two tables. So there's not going to be this automatic filtering that occurs through those relationships in my data model. Instead, we're going to use a DAX expression to kind of build that relationship and say, hey, if it's selected here, then it should show up here. If it's not selected here, then it would not show up over here. All right. So instead of having a slicer here on this table, we'll bring this down. We're going to create a new slicer here from our new table from departments. All right. So let's turn that into a slicer visual. We'll come into our items here and then go ahead and make that a little bit larger so we can see it. And ultimately what we want to do is if I click on IT, I should be able to see all four records here that have IT anywhere inside of that affected department. If I click on tax, I should see the one here at the bottom, the final record, as well as the first record. If I click on multiple in the slicer, then I should be able to see everything that has either HR or tax. So that's how we want to build out this expression. All right, so I'm going to go back to my department goals, and we're going to create a calculated measure for this example. So up on my modeling ribbon at the top, I'll select calculated measure. And then for this example, this is going to be a little bit more code than the last one here. I'm going to create a new measure here, and this is going to be called is filtered. Let's clean that up a little bit. Is filtered. And like I said, this is going to be quite a bit more code than in our last example, uh, but that's okay. So the first thing we'll do here is we're going to have our conditional logic test. So we're going to use if, and then inside of if, I need to use the sumx function so that we can iterate our slicer table. We're going to look at each individual row inside of that table. And then the expression that we're going to perform in that table is going to be using the find function. So remember, we want to use the find function to essentially return whether the value is zero or greater than zero. If it's greater than zero, we know it exists. It's, it, it exists somewhere in that record. If it's equal to zero, it does not exist. So we're going to use the find function here. So I'm going to return the find function. You could do this with either the find or the search function. In my next demo, I'm going to use the search function just to give you a look at really both of these. Now the find function, as you can see right here, is case sensitive. So because of that, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add to this expression the kind of upper function here to really turn it into kind of an in-case sensitive or case insensitive operation. And the, the text that I want to use here, uh, look at, let's, let's step back one example. The first parameter for find function is the text that you want to find. So what is the text that I want to find? I want to get the text from my slicer table, all right, from slicer departments. So slicer departments, all right? So whatever values exist in my slicer departments, I want to pass those values in, I want to pass those values into our slicer, it's not correct, let me see here. I want to pass those values into my department, there we go, department goals, and then affected departments. So let's take one more quick look at this. What I'm doing is I'm going to iterate over slicer table. So SumX is going to look at each individual row one by one performing this expression. It's going to look at the first row and it's going to pass in the value from my slicer departments, which is right here. It's going to take tax because that's all that exists currently. That's all we've selected is tax. It's going to take tax and it's going to pass it into this column in the department goals table and it's going to look for that and it's going to say, does it, uh, what is the value essentially that's going to get returned? Remember, this isn't like the contained where it's if it exists, it just returns a value. So it's going to return a value of either zero or one. So let's close that out there. Uh, we do want to make sure that if it doesn't return a value, we return just a basic value of zero. If we don't put in a not found value there, it will fail in a lot of instances because, of course, the slicer doesn't exist in every single row. All right. So then the last thing we want to do is, as part of our if expression, is we want to say if it is greater than zero. So we need to close this one out, make sure we get all of this closed properly. And now we want to say if it's greater than zero, then what do we want to do if the value is true? Well, if, if it returns a value greater than zero, that means that the text did exist in that row. So that means the value is greater than zero. So if it's greater than zero and it does exist, I want to return true. All right, I want to return true. If the value is equal to zero, it's not greater than zero, it's equal to zero, that means it, it, did, not, uh, it did not exist. It, it was not anywhere inside of that expression, HR or tax or IT, whatever we were searching for did not exist. So the value is actually equal to false. All right, so let's walk through this one more time. Sumx is going to iterate over the slicer table, so those are the values here in our slicer table. 
it's going to pass those values into the department goals, affected goals, and it's going to see if they, have, it's going to really just return the starting position of the text. If the starting position of the text is greater than zero in that row, so for example, we're searching for tax, right? If you're looking at this first row, the starting position would be one, which is greater than zero, so the value is true. It does, uh, it does exist. If you're looking at the second one, if I was searching the second row here, IT, for tax, it doesn't exist, so it would return a row of zero because that's the default value that we gave it. And it would do this on each row, essentially, in that column. So if it does show up, it will return a value. On the last one here, it's going to count this out, so that'd be five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. The starting position of tax would be 12, which is, of course, greater than zero. So on that row, it would return a value of true. All right, so once again, it's the find function is a easier function. Um, it is an introductory function, but you can use it in more advanced scenarios like this scenario here. Now, once we create this is filtered calculated measure, what we can do then is we can kind of look at this inside of our table and see what that looks like. All right, so let me click outside of that. Over here in my department goals, I have this measure. I'm going to drag and drop that into my is filtered table or into my table here. Let me expand that out a little bit. And now you can kind of see what's going on with this as I'm kind of working through this. If I click on finance, you'll see that the only one that's true in this table is just the fourth record. If I click on HR, it'll change. Well, actually, it's the same one that's true. If I click on tax, the first record and the last record are true. If I click on IT, the bottom four are true, but the top one is false. And then, of course, I could come in here and multi-select. And if I multi-select everything, everything is true. If I select IT and the tax, those are really the two combinations here. Everything is true. But now what I've done is I've created my own filter here where I can click on a filter in my departments table, and then that essentially will filter the table itself. And it's disconnected, and we're doing that by really just using an advanced use case of the find function. Now, unfortunately, you can see that the is filtered is working here, but it's not actually filtering the table, right? Everything still shows up in the table. So the next step here, and the reason we created this as a calculated measure, the next step here is because we can use measures inside of our filters. So I'm going to remove the is filtered. We, we know it's working correctly here. I'm going to remove it from the table, all right, and remove it from the visual there. And then I'm going to take that measure, and what I want to do is I want to drag it into the filter section under my fields, all right? So in your fields for your visuals as well as your page and your report level, you have options to drag fields in here. The fields that you drag in here need to be essentially calculated measures if you want to bring them into the page or the report level. So I'm going to find that calculated measure here. I'm just going to drop this into the visual level filter. I'm going to add that in. And then what I want to say is if the value is true, so we're going to go to true here, if the value of that row is equal to true, then display it in the table in the visual. All right, so we're going to apply filter. If it's not equal to true, then it should not be displayed. So instead of actually putting that um, you know, somewhere else in our, our report or putting it in the table, now we're just displaying it here. So now if I click on HR or IT or tax, you'll see that the values in my table are changing accordingly based on the value that I'm selecting here because we've created that calculated measure that calculated measure is being used in a filter inside of my report, which is then indirectly or really directly filtering down this table. Keep in mind, of course, these filters have different scopes. So you could do this at the visual level. You could do this at the table level uh, or at the page level, or you could do this for the entire report, which is essentially every single page inside of this PBIX file that we are working with. All right. Um, so yeah, and, and I found that filters here are really an underutilized feature of Power BI because most people simply use slicers, right? We all want to use slicers, we enjoy slicers, so we only use slicers in our report. So for example, let's go ahead and get rid of this here so we have no filters. Let me make this a little bit bigger real quick. Um, I've brought in is filtered, and then I want to add is filtered as a slicer here. Of course I can't because it's a measure. So because it's a measure, I can't add it in as a slicer. That's why we had to use it as a filter. If you're curious about that, why did I use it as a filter? Uh, the reason for that is because it is a measure. All right. So that is the second demo that we were going to do today. So let's go ahead and flip back over to our demo. And just to really quickly kind of uh, review this to maybe clear up any confusion I might have caused, what we're doing here is we're essentially just searching a piece of text. We're searching that column in that table to say, look, if, or the row within the column. If the row in the column, um, if the text that we're searching that row with, if it returns a value greater than zero, then we know it's 
what we want. We're essentially using find and using search here as a like operator to say if it's like IT, then we know it's like IT because it returned a value greater than zero. So we're going to hard code the value of that to true, meaning that it is like IT, so we want to show it in our table. If it's not like IT, if IT is the one that we're searching on, if it's not like IT, it returns a value of zero. So if it returns a value of zero, then we're hard coding the value as false. So we're doing, we're essentially using the find operation here to simulate that kind of like operator that we don't have that comes from, you know, T-SQL, something similar to T-SQL. All right, so let's do, um, well, I didn't mean to close that out, so let me go find PowerPoint again and bring that back up. So the next example here is going to be using search, and I'm going to use it in a very similar capacity. Now, this example, or the problem that I want to solve here is really more of an advanced data modeling problem as well. Actually, as I was Earlier this week, two days ago, Manuel Quintana, who is uh, one of the guys who also works in our training department here, uh, had a problem that he came across, and he came and asked me if I had seen the problem or if I had come across this problem before, and it was really an advanced data modeling problem. And I said, hey, look, I just had this problem a couple months ago. Here's how you would solve that. It's pretty easy to do. So what I want to do is I have two separate tables here, and in those two separate tables, I have values that are similar, but unfortunately, they're not identical. So in my example here, I have MLS data. Uh, if you were on my last webinar, you saw more information around the MLS data, so you're somewhat familiar with that. But I have some MLS data in one table, and then I have another table that I bring in school grades data. And the school grades data that I bring in also has the school name. So in my MLS data, I have the high school that you know, is applicable for each home that is purchased. And then in my school grades data that shows you know, the grades for each school for the last 10 years, I have the high school as well. But unfortunately, the MLS data is not consistent because it's realtors that are inputting that information, and it doesn't always exactly match the high school data. So I'm having difficulty here bringing the data together so that I can build a correlation in my data model that says, look, when a school does really well and it's an A school or a B school, uh, property values are going up and the interest in those neighborhoods are going up and new construction is going up and maybe if the schools are doing worse, you know, people are moving out of those areas and values are going down. Now, I don't know that to be true based on my analysis, right, because I'm trying to build a data model to prove that. But in order to prove that, I need to be able to relate those two tables together. And that's the problem that I really had here in this example. So to give you a visual of what that looks like, here on the left-hand side of the screen, you see my MLS data. And you can see there's some differences here, and we'll talk through these as we go through this demo. But on the left-hand side of the screen, I have Allen D. Nice High School, which is a high school here in Jacksonville, Florida. And on the right-hand side, I have Allen D. Nice Senior High School, and this is how it is how it shows up in that school data that's provided by the government, all right, or whatever government entity provides that information and grades all of those different schools. So this is how it showed up in the CSV data that I pulled off of the web. And I need to build a relationship between these two tables. And unfortunately, sometimes when you get data from the government websites or mainframe data or data from the web, it's difficult to find relationships there because the data doesn't exactly match. So like I said, this is it's a little bit advanced DAX, but it's really more advanced data modeling as well. How do I build a relationship when the values don't match here? All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the search function instead of the find function. The search function is essentially going to do the same thing as the find function. It returns the number of the character at which a specific character or text string is found. So it searches a text for another text string, and it returns the starting position of that, that text string if it finds that value. Unlike find, this one is case insensitive, so we don't have to use the upper function. We don't have to build that out. Um, and typically, from a performance perspective, you know, if you don't need to use find, you should go ahead and use search. It's going to perform a little bit better than the find function because it doesn't have to worry about case sensitivity. The, the syntax here is exactly the same. We first give it the text that we want to find. We then tell it within what text we want to find it. We tell it where we want it to start within that text. We're just going to hard, we're just going to use the default, which means start from the very beginning. So we're not going to put anything for that parameter. And then the fourth parameter is very important as well. We need to make sure we put in a value of zero or something else as the default. Because if you don't put a value in there for the not found, then it will generate an error whenever it searches a text and doesn't find a value. It generates an error because it doesn't know what to return. So this is really an upgrade uh, in DAX. In previous versions of DAX and older versions, you didn't have that optional parameter, so you had to nest this inside of like an if error function. Say, oh, if it generates an error, then return zero. But now we can just use this not found value here. The other thing that I'm going to introduce here is the substitute function. The substitute function is essentially like a replace function. It, it replaces existing text with new text in a text string. The reason I need the substitute function, if you remember from those, uh, if we just go back real quick, you notice on the screen on the left, I have Alan D. period niece, and on the screen on the right, I have Alan D. niece. 
So it doesn't have that period. So I have to remove that period essentially from both sides of, you know, both input columns. I have to remove the period so that I can get a match. So we're also going to use the substitute here just to re re replace any characters that we don't want to show up here inside of our data model. So we're going to use substitute. Substitute, the syntax here is you tell it the text that you want to search. You give it the old text, uh, the text that you want to remove. You, you give it the text that you want to replace that with. And then, you know, the instance, uh, uh, the number of occurrences where you want to do that at. All right. So let's jump back into Power BI Desktop and uh, take a look at this next demo real quick here. Here we go. So on the left-hand side, I have this MLS data. And what I did uh, for this example, I think I might have done this for my last webinar, is I've created a, a filtered table. I've created a calculated table using DAX, which is a filtered table from my original MLS table. And the reason for that is I want to come over here, and MLS table has a ton of just a ton of great data in here, some, some, some data that's not so good as well, but a ton of data. And from a performance or, or troubleshooting perspective, I really wanted to simplify this table to only show me the, the columns that I needed. I don't want to see all the columns. I just want to see the columns that I need. So I created a filtered version of that table for this demo or for demo purposes. So we're going to be doing all our work on the MLS filter table, and that's why. Now, if I go over to my school grades table, I can come over here, and I want to bring in the school name. So I'm going to bring the school name in. I'm going to bring that in as a table. I'll go in here, and I want to just create some consistency real quick. So I'm going to create that with my bold header with flasher rows, flashy rows. And uh, we can take a look at this. So this is what I have. This is what I'm trying to build a relationship on here. I am trying to build a relationship on Allen D. Nice. Now, there's a ton of schools in here. It's probably all the schools for Florida. Uh, but we can filter this down, which we'll do here in just a moment when we create this join condition. But this is what we want to do. So just like you saw in the PowerPoint, I want to create a relationship here between Alan Denise to Alan Denise and from Bartram Trail down to, let's see if we can find Bartram Trail real quick, to Bartram Trail. And you'll see that in each situation here, uh, the names just, they don't match. So over here we have Bartram Trail High School. This is really, if you're looking at this, this is more qualified, right? It's telling you if it's a high school or a middle school. It's adding senior high school. It's adding things like that. Whereas what's being put in the MLS is a little bit lax of date. We're just entering as much as we need to enter so we can get the job done. So this is what's being entered in the MLS over here. And then this part over here is what's being actually shown up in that government document that shows us the different grades for the different schools. So just to get you familiar with this data set real quick, we can come in here and take a look at this. You'll see that I have um, the school names. That exists here in this table. And then if we go over a little bit, you'll see that the other thing that's important here is the school grade that's really what we're going to look at. But we also get the grade year. And since we get a new grade for each school for every year, the relationship that I want to build between these two tables is on the school name as well as the year. So I want to find out what is the grade for each year. Actually, if I want to get more complicated here, I would want to look at the year that a home sold and look at the grade for that school the previous year, right? So if the grade for that school last year was an A, it was an A-rated school. That would explain why people are moving in this year because it was A-rated. But we're not going to get that complex here, but that's probably what I would want to look at. All right, so now I need to create a relationship between these two tables. And we're going to do this one using a calculated column instead of a calculated measure. So I'm going to come back over to my MLS filtered table. And then inside of this table, I'm going to come up to my modeling tab, and we're going to create a new calculated column on this table. And let's zoom in here and start working kind of through this example. So I'm going to go ahead and call this, I'll give this a name. The name here is going to be high school, and let's call this my high school name. We're going to replace this when we get done with the school grade. But for validation purposes, I want to just bring in first, before bringing in the grade, I actually want to bring in the high school name to make sure that it is working correctly. So we're going to bring in the school name here, and I'm going to type in calculate. I'm going to use the calculate function here. The expression I want to return is going to be the max And then that's the wrong one. I want to go to my school names table, school grades, and then we're looking for school name. There we go. So I want to return the max school name from that table. That's my expression. And then really we need to import a couple of different filters on this. So as part of my filter criteria at the calculate function, I need to put three, three filters on this. The first one is limiting this to just high schools. So in my MLS data, you have three different columns. You have the middle school for that home, the, the elementary school for that home, and the high school for that home. So I would have to do the same type of uh, 
function, this advanced function, this advanced relationship here, I would have to do that in three, uh, three different calculated columns since it's separated out, which makes sense for a home. I'd want to see what is the grade for the high school, what is the grade for the middle school, what is the grade for the elementary school, because that might be more applicable to my, my, my kids and their grade level. So the first criteria here is we're going to, let's just do the year first. So I want to look at the MLS and the, and remember we want to do filtered here, sorry about that. The MLS, and I want to look at the sold year of a home, the year that a home sold, and where that is equal to the school grades table. So if we can get that to pop up. Oh, we got to do filter, sorry about that. Got to add in the filter function. And where that is equal to the school grades table. Still not wanting to show up for me here. Well, got to do my table, of course. Sorry about that. I'm just learning DAX myself. Not really, but I'm nervous being on this call. All right, so let's finish this up. So I got to have my first filter criteria. And the first filter criteria is where the MLS filtered sold year equals the year from the, the school grades table. The reason that's important is because, remember, you have of an entry for each individual year that takes place there. So we're going to bring in our grade year, and then that's our first filter criteria. We're going to have multiple criteria. So and, we can use the double and percent sign here to do an and operator or an and function. And the second thing I want to do here is the school type. So I'm only going to look for school types in my school grade table. So I'm going to say where school grades, and then let's see, I think it's called school type. There it is, equals three. I know, just because I know the data, that three equals high school. So I would definitely recommend that anytime you're kind of working through or doing complex DAX like here, add as many uh, comments to your code as you can so you can come back and other people can look at your code and understand what's going on there. So we know that three equals high school. And then the third filter criteria, and this one's a little bit more complex, but this is where we're going to add in that search function, is going to be the search function. And the text that I want to find is going to come from my high school table my high school table. So we're going to say MLS filtered and then high school. So I want to take the values from MLS filtered high school and look inside of the school grade table to see if that exists, right? So that's going to be my search. The text that I'm going to search within is going to be my school grades and then school name table or school name column. The starting position, remember we're going to go with just the default of that starting from the very first value. And then we want to make sure that if it doesn't show up, that we simply uh, replace it with a value of zero, all right? And then I'm going to say if the value is greater than zero, then it meets my filter criteria, so go ahead and return that value. If it is not greater than zero, then it doesn't meet it, so we're just going to ignore those rows. All right, so now we just close out our calculate statement, and let's walk through this one more time. That was a lot of code, and um, I messed up in the middle there, so I uh, kind of lost some continuity. So the very first thing I want to do is I want to return the school name. This is a calculated column, I'm going to say, you know, if, if multiple names somehow get returned, return the maximum school name. And then my, I have to add my filter criteria here. And I'm going to filter over the school grades table, essentially filtering that down. And I'm going to say, all right, for the first row, remember that filter is an X function or an iterator function. So it's going to iterate over the school grades table, kind of row by row operation. On the first, uh, the first filter criteria says where MLS sold year, the sold year of the home equals the grade year that that school got that grade. Now remember I said I would probably change this to be the previous year so I could see how home sales this year correlate to grades from last year, but we're going to keep this simple here. The next thing I would do is look at only high schools because we only want to bring in the high schools. So the school type for high schools is a grade value of three. And then in our third criteria we're saying that when we do this search and we take, uh, let's say, Alan D. Nice and we pass Alan D. Nice into this column here, if it is exist in there or if it's like that, we're simulating that like operation again, then it will return a value greater than zero. So if it returns a greater value greater than zero, then it evaluates to true for this filter. So return that as a school name, and then we'll get the max school name for that row that we were operating on, which should only return a distinct value unless something's wrong with my criteria here, but we need to add that max in there. So once we finish writing this out, I can go ahead and click outside of the syntax here. And then what I want to do is come over to my MLS filter table, and then let's add our new column into this table here. See what that looks like. So I have high school name. I'm going to bring that in. And then it looks pretty good. We're getting some pretty good results here. So let's kind of take a look at this. So notice that Alan D. Nice still did not show up. The reason for that is because of 
that D right there, that, that period that shows up in that value. So we know that when we looked at Alan D. Nice over here in this table, and that there were some significant differences between the two. Let's see if we can find that real quick. There it is. So in Alan D. Nice on the right, there's no period, there's no character there. So we really need to replace that from both sides. And this is going to show up in a lot of different schools, not just this example here. So we need to clean this up a little bit more. But you'll see that Bartram Trail is now getting a match. Creekside High School is getting a match. Mandarin High School is getting a match. You will notice that some of these are not getting a match. And this is just a problem with my school grades data. I only brought in about eight years of data, and I didn't bring in data for 2015 or 2016. So I only have data from really 2007 to 2014, and that was just the data that I could find that was readily available. That was the most current data I could find from that data set. But I, I could search a little bit harder and find better data, I'm sure. But that, I know why these aren't showing up. So I could return some kind of non-applicable value. It just means, look, I can't really build a correlation for the most current years, but I can definitely build that correlation for later years to see, does the school grade have an impact on home sales? So now, we need to go up here and kind of clean this up a little bit for Allen D. Nice High School. So I'll go back into that column for my high school name. And then really all I want to do here is I want to look at the right here on my search criteria, I want to replace any of those characters that we don't want to see here. So we're going to use the substitute function for that. So let me zoom back in. I'm going to type in the substitute function. And then it says, what is the text that you're going to work on? Well, this is the text. And then I'm going to put a comma in here. The old text is going to be a period, and I want to replace that with an empty string. Simply just want to get rid of that. I need to do that to both columns, though. All right, so both strings. So I'm going to type in substitute again. And then that is the text that I want to kind of perform my operation on. Uh, the old text or the text I want to replace is a period. And then I will add in an empty string. And then I need to add a comma here for the start position. Let me make sure that looks good. Yep, so that looks good. Now, unfortunately, if you had multiple characters, so let's say there's dashes and there's colons and there's semicolons and there's different characters that you need to remove, and you would just have to do a series of nested functions here with using either replace or substitute to remove those different characters from that column. But what this does is it removes them from this column if they ever show up. If they're over here and they're not over here, it removes them from this column, making it easier to kind of join these two together. So I'm going to hit enter, click in the background now, and then now if you look over here, we'll see that now we're getting a match on Alan D. Nice. So the reason I'm bringing school name into my MLS filter table is because I want to make sure and just validate that the relationship I'm building does work. Now I have two options here. Um, I could go into my relationships tab, all right, fine, let's see what we have here. I'm gonna zoom out, I'm gonna kinda of hit my camera icon here to bring everything in focus. I could, let me see what time it is. All right, we got a few minutes. I could just bring in and build a relationship between these two tables now on the grade name. All right, so I could find the school name, or the school name, I could find the school name here. I added the name here, so I could build a relationship between these two if I wanted to do that. And then they have a relationship like every other table in my data model. So that's how we, from an advanced data modeling perspective, that's how you bring two tables together that are similar, but they're not exactly the same. This is not a one-size-fits-all solution. This won't work for every solution. You're going to find discrepancies in the model, but I did the best I could with what I had. I noticed that one, you know, one table was more fully qualified than the other. So I said, look, let's just take this table on the left and, and try to perform a match to the one on the right. For the most part, this works very, very good for my example. And I could see where you could use this in a lot of other scenarios to kind of create the same type of uh, functionality. But what I want to do here is let's forget using um, the, the relationship. I just want to bring the grade name in instead of the school name. We brought the school name in. We validated it, that it's working correctly here. So let's change the grade name or the school name and just return the grade. So the grade in that table I think is just simply grade. So I'm going to return the grade instead of the school name. I'm just going to return that. That's my new expression. Return the max grade. And then for the, the high school, and then we are going to return grade. All right, so we're changing the name of the column, and then we're, re, we're, we're exchanging the value that we're going to return as a result of this expression that we're building out. So now I'm going to hit enter again. Nope, so it's not grade. Let's see which one it is here. We're going to go over to our school grades table, and then we're going to navigate all the way over. Oh, it's actually called value. All right, so let's go over here one more time real quick. And then click on value. Why is that not being, oh, I misspelled it. Spelling counts, of course. 
All right, let's close that up. There we go. So now we have the high school grade for each one of these high schools for each year. You'll see that the high school grade is actually changing, kind of bouncing back and forth. Bartram Trail is doing really well, uh, really, really well. And we can go down and we can see how these different schools are performing and look at this information. I filtered this table down to only show so many schools and so many columns. So it's a simpler example, but really cool way of really working with bad data and using really simple functions to do that. So the search and find functions, let's get uh, just basic functions, but we can use them in advanced capacity to kind of solve this problem here. All right, so let's go back over to PowerPoint real quick. In this section here, just do a quick review, and then I'll open it up to Erica to see what questions you guys have. Couple things here. One, the video is being recorded just like all of our webinars, so I highly recommend. I know I talk fast, but I try to fit in as much as I can into a webinar. So uh, if something didn't quite click for you, feel free, go back and review the webinar, and you can slow it down. Uh, and, and kind of walk through these examples yourself. Uh, and then two, I won't have time to get to all the questions here. I know some of the questions are going to be more abstract. They're going to be more scenario based. So feel free to, you know, really kind of come in there and just send me an email. I don't have time to get to everybody's email because sometimes I get bombarded with a lot of emails. I have a lot going on, but I do try to at least respond or give you a blog or give you some kind of reference to help you out uh, kind of in the future if you need you know, to point you in the right direction. So if you have a question, feel free to email me, but perform it, you know, give me as much information as you can so I can help you out. And so we don't have this, you know, sometimes I have, I have an email chain that's 15 or 20 emails long and that's just too much work as far as, you know, in the middle of my day kind of breaking and sending information back and forth. So send me, a lot of times, send me just a, a prototype of it, you know. Um, dumb your model down, remove everything you don't need like I did here where I created a filter table with just a sample set of data and tell me your scenario and what you're trying to accomplish clearly, and I can try to help you out with that. I love helping people out. It gives me a lot of uh, examples for future blogs and webinars, um, and it helps me kind of fine-tune my skills as well because I'm always trying to learn DAX. So, Erica, uh, I'm going to end it there. I put my contact information on the screen, but we got a couple minutes. I can't see any of the questions in the chat window. I don't have organizer right, but if you want to read out some of them to me. Yep, no problem. Um, so we have about five minutes, so let's uh, – so anyone who – would like to um, ask some questions, just um, feel free. Um, let me see here. Uh, Gabriel asks, what's, what's the difference between find and search? Yeah, so the difference between find and search is find is case sensitive, meaning that if I was saying uh, I wanted to look, look for capital M in Mitchell, so I didn't want to look for lowercase m's, I just wanted to look for capital M, then I would use the find function because it's I can, use, I can look for something that's case sensitive, that's capital or lowercase specific. Uh, the search function is case insensitive, so it doesn't care if it's lowercase or uppercase. Like I said, search will normally, it's going to perform better because it doesn't have to worry about case sensitivity. Find is going to have a little bit worse performance, but it's case sensitive, so it allows you to do a little bit more as far as looking for very specific criteria, very specific text within a string. Okay. Um... Binu asks here, uh, where do I find more DAX functions and examples? Yeah, so the best place to find the DAX functions is, let me see if I have uh, Chrome open here. The best place for me is really just go to uh, msdn.com. Uh, you know, you go to the Microsoft's webpage, you look for DAX functions, you can really navigate through those. So let me pull those up real quick. I'll do a quick search and kind of pull that over and show you where that is. But if you just do a Bing search real quick, and pull up MSDN DAX. You can go to the DAX function reference and you can look through all the functions that exist. Also note that when I was writing those functions inside of Power BI, that Power BI has some great IntelliSense. So if you just start typing date, it'll know you're trying to look for a date function. It'll bring up all the relative, you know, date, all the date functions that start with that. But if you come out to the MSDN page, easy way to come in here and say, you know what, I'm trying to do a, um, I don't know, date and time function. You can click on that. And then it shows you all the different options available here. You can, there's an end of month function. It just brings back the end of the month. There's a date different function that shows you the difference between two dates. And you can click on that, and then it will show you, it'll kind of give you a definition of what that is. All right, so it returns the count of interval boundaries crossed between two dates, and it gives you the syntax there. So that's one good way. Another way is follow people like myself and, and some of the people in the community that do a lot of DAX. So Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari, um, Chris Webb, uh, Rob Coley, people that, that, that are actively on Twitter, anytime they either write a new blog that tells you how to go through some of these examples, they'll post it on Twitter. 
um, or uh, they retweet examples that other people do as well. So those are two good ways of learning more DAX. Awesome. Okay. Um, and let's see here. Uh, John asks, sounds like this is related to the first question um, I asked, but he says, um, since find is case sensitive, why did you use it if you negated it by using upper? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I talk really fast, so I didn't really explain why I used it. Um, I only use it just to show a, a little bit additional functionality that you could still use find and you could just use upper there. So I kind of just wanted to show an additional function and show the upper function and show what it does to introduce everybody to the upper function. But definitely from a simplicity perspective, I should have just used search. That's all. Okay, um, let's take one more question here. Um, why were you using the function max? Um, so that's that's a little bit longer to answer. I'll try to answer that one inside of a uh, inside of the block. But when you're when you're using a a calculate inside of calculate and you have an expression, calculate expects an a an like an aggregation almost. So it expects an aggregation like a sum or an average or a count or max. It doesn't expect just a raw value. So that's why I had to use max in there. If you try to go back and use that calculation that I used and you remove max, it won't work. Now, inherently, I really didn't need, if you think about this outside of the, the constructs of what's expected inside of the calculate function, I really don't need that aggregate because I know that the DAX is only going to return one school name or one school grade. But DAX doesn't know that, so you have to use it kind of like an aggregation. Do you want to do you want to sum up the total? Do you want to average it? Do you want to return the min or the max? So for our example, we could have just simply used min or max. But the reason we had to do that is because we had to use calculate to generate to get that to work. And calculate expects really like an aggregated type expression for the first parameter. And I turned it into an aggregated expression by using max. That's why. But it's it's a little bit more of a you know a longer explanation than what I can give in 30 seconds. All right. Well, again, it's noon, so thank you so much, Mitch, for presenting today. Um, again, everyone, all attendees today, um, I will be sending all of your questions over to Mitchell, so he'll be able to um, address that in either a blog post or get back to you um, on an individual basis. So I thank you guys all for joining our webinar today. Um, as always, we will be sending all registrants a follow-up email, including a link to the full recording of today's webinar. Um, you can also find the recording on our website at pragmaticworks.com. So we thank you again for your time, and we look forward to seeing you all next Tuesday for another free training session. All right.